welcome. We're, we're as you can hear, uh, so excited to to have you here. So grateful for you to spend some of your time helping us. To, as 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 Julie just said, you know, we've got to create a movement here, and you and I've talked about this. So I mean, we 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 know that that's what we've got to do. So let's just jump in. Nation states, cyber crime. One of the things you wrote in your book that I'd find just absolutely, I mean, it's it's like. Is this the godfather all over again? And the answer is yes. You wrote, Putin laid down only two rules for Russia's hackers. First, no hacking inside the motherland. And second, when the Kremlin calls in a favor, you do whatever it asks. You know, Vito Corleone right there. You know, otherwise hackers had full autonomy and oh, how Putin loved them. What's going on here? So, yeah, what is going on there? Um it, there's so there's so much to unpack there, but I think the number one thing is, you know, from a technical standpoint, when you look at these ransomware attacks, we've seen that the first thing that these groups do is search your computer for their default language settings. And in a lot of cases, if your default language setting is Russian or uh, that of a, a post-Soviet state, the code moves right along, right? It doesn't infect you. And I think that is part one of don't hack inside the motherland. Um, and then two, you know, uh, when we call in a favor, you do whatever we ask. I think that was probably best illustrated in the indictments against uh, the hackers who breached Yahoo a couple of years ago. When you read that indictment, and I would really encourage everyone to read it because I think it lays it out pretty clearly. What it was, was two FSB agents and two cyber criminals and FSB agents basically let the cyber criminals do their thing, you know, steal hundreds of millions of credentials. Uh, but if they found the credentials for someone who worked at the State Department or the White House for their personal Yahoo account, they were expected to pass that over to the FSB. And so just kind of it, it made it clear as day that the Kremlin really sees cyber criminals as a national asset. And then the other thing to bring into this conversation is that when I was brought into some of the Snowden leaks, which is something that I, I talk quite a bit about in, in the book, um, one of the things that was very interesting was this uh, national intelligence estimate that was dated 2009 that was in those leaks. And for the first time that year, the NSA had ranked our, our digital adversaries in terms of their cyber prowess, let's say, you know, in terms of their skill sets. And at the time, they, they found that Russia was at the top of the heap, just in terms of their skill sets. But they weren't considered the most immediate threat uh, from a national security perspective because most of their activities was focused, were focused on spam, identity theft, credit card theft, you know, cybercrime. China was considered the more imminent threat, not so much for its sophistication, but just for the brazenness with which they were stealing our intellectual property. And I think what has changed over the last 10 years is Russia is not just doing spam and identity theft and credit card theft anymore. You know, they are engaging in ransomware attacks that are inch, inching dangerously closer to critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I think this might actually be the one year anniversary or it's coming up of Colonial Pipeline. Right. Um, and we saw in the initial days of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you know, some of the members of that Conti ransomware group come out and say that they would retaliate with attacks on the critical infrastructure of Western countries who supported Ukraine. So we're starting to see that this very murky relationship is, is much more direct than we even gave it credit for. But at the same time, you know, by tapping into Russia's cyber criminals, Putin can do what he did a couple of years ago when he said, hackers are like artists who wake up in the morning in a good mood and start painting. You know, in other words, I have no say over what they do and don't do. And he, by, by leveraging cyber criminals, he can really, he has, a, he has a degree of plausible deniability that we don't have here, right? Because most of our attacks come from cyber command or if it's intelligence related, it comes through the various intelligence agencies. And where that gets really hairy is on trying to come up with some kind of international norms here. Because when I've interviewed people in the U.S. Intelligence Committee about what, it, what, it, what are the chances we could get to a digital Geneva Convention 
they say, look, we would love to do that. We'd love to get some agreement not to hack each other's hospitals or elections or power grid, but we can't do that. Looks like I got muted, sorry. Yeah. You can't do that with an actor like Putin um, who who is constantly outsourcing these attacks. And we see something similar with China starting to outsource some of their most sensitive operations to these private citizens that clearly have a targeting requirement from the Ministry of State Security, but is another area that we don't really truly understand the direct relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, what you're talking about, just this interconnection between the political side and the cyber criminal side is makes all of this so much so much more challenging. And just listening to you brings to mind both two countries you haven't named, uh, one of them being North Korea, whose economy is supported by cybercrime, and the other being Iran as well, that we've got both of those countries that support their people doing mm-hmm. cybercrime. Yeah, and I think, you know, when I joined the Times and started covering this issue, I was a complete noob to this space. Um, and what happened in the decade I was there, a little bit more than a decade, was that politics and cybersecurity or cyber vulnerability, I call it, have became truly intertwined in a way that I don't think industry saw very clearly. Really? And these days, every country is using some kind of offensive cyber capability, or maybe it's an off the shelf click and shoot spyware for their own national security purposes. So Iran, you're right, you know, they, well, sorry, North Korea, you're right. They see that, okay, we're locked in with sanctions, but we can skirt sanctions with these hacks of the Bank of Bangladesh, uh, the hacks of the cryptocurrency exchanges. And so that's Mm -hmm. where their energy and hacking resources are focused. It's on, you know, generating the cash that they need to get back Mm -hmm. to their new weapons programs. Iran, it was really interesting to watch what was happening in the lead up to the Iran nuclear deal under Obama and then what happened uh, when when Trump ripped it up. So, you know, we had seen these attacks that were getting more and more um, destructive. You know, the the attacks on Sands Casino, Saudi Aramco, the DDoS attacks against the banks. Um, And Then when we started engaging with them diplomatically uh, on the potential for a a deal, we saw a huge drop off in the- Oops, you just dropped. Nicole just dropped off, forgive us. Uh, I'm sure- Sorry. There there she is. A video issue. Hopefully it doesn't happen again and hopefully you'll see me soon. In the meantime, I'll just be a (laughs) voice of God. Okay. So, yeah, you know, just on Iran, we saw a huge drop off in that kind of cyber sabotage leading up to the deal. We saw them much more focused on cyber espionage of diplomats and foreign ministries, likely trying to get intelligence about what the other countries were going to bring to the table. And then when we signed the deal, we we also saw a huge drop off in in hacks from Iran. Uh, But once Trump ripped it up, we started seeing more activity along the lines of probes of critical infrastructure, uh, et cetera. So, you know, it really showed you sort of the arc of how politics influences nation state cyber activity. And then the other one I talked about in the book is the Gulf, you know, from their perspective, their biggest national security threat is another Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. And so what are the Doing. They are pouring resources into NSO groups, Pegasus, you know, their, their new counterparts and, and competitors, um, because they want to spy on journalists and dissidents and people who are pressing for greater enfranchisement, like Ahmed Mansour. You know, that mm-hmm. is where their energy is focused. So this is not slowing down. It's just that countries are really starting to see uh, what can be done with these tools. And if they mm-hmm. don't have them, there is an entire market that has crept up to meet that demand. Right. Good, good, good point. We'll come back to that piece of the discussion in a bit. I want to take a break right now um, from this discussion. We'll, we'll take a couple of these kinds of breaks over the course of, of, of this morning. Um, and, and this break specifically to talk about Secure the Village. 
who we are, what we're about, what what are we're we're trying to do. And towards that end, I want to share my screen. Uh, we have a fabulous uh, videographer, Elias Rappaporto of uh, Viaduct Pictures, who uh, put together a little video for us that we're incredibly proud of. So I want to share this. Cybersecurity isn't simple. So if you think you're about to watch a cute video with bouncy music that tells you how what you thought was hard is actually easy and what you thought was complicated is actually just like one, two, three, rest assured, this isn't it. Because cybersecurity isn't simple. And what we do weaves together law, technology, risk management, governance, public policy, education, political philosophy, psychology, and even questions of freedom and of war and peace. Cybersecurity isn't simple, but the values that motivate us are. The value that says we should treat others' information as we would like our information to be treated. That cybersecurity is an urgent civic duty for the 21st century citizen. And the value that says none of us is as smart as all of us. And that's why we're getting everyone involved. Building bridges between those who dedicate their lives to cybersecurity and helping everyday citizens complete that last mile. Transforming our neighbors into powerful cyber guardians. Cybersecurity isn't simple, but the values that motivate us are. And our values say that there's a seat at the table for anyone with something to contribute to the global exchange of knowledge we're building at Secure the Village. Because from the boardroom to the living room, it takes a village to secure the village. So there, that's, that's our video. And the essence behind this, it seems to me, is a, a, a quote of, of William Gibson's, the author, that says, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And Nicole, you and I both feel that same way about cybersecurity. I mean, we've talked about that. I think most of the people on this uh, webinar, on this event, kind of understand that. And so, so much of what we have to do is take the knowledge and the education and the passion of those who are connected in this space, who already kind of get it, if you will, and reach out, help those who don't. And, and, and I speak very specifically of uh, groups, if you will, that, that don't get it. Those include many of, the, of our smaller businesses. They're 44% of the economy. Uh, so that it's a significant number. I mean, if, if you look at uh, Colonial Pipeline, they're not a large company, they're big, but they're not enormous. You know, they're not a Bank of America. Uh, you look at, uh, you know, so many of these other hacks and, and breaches, they're coming in to the small businesses and, and, and individuals. I mean, uh, a, a recent story in the individual level is a colleague of ours, 82-year-old mother got uh, scammed out of fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 by uh, scammers who told her her computer was compromised, asked her to uh, go buy gift cards, give them the serial numbers, you know, the, the ID numbers on the back. And they walked away, as I said, with, with 50, 60, $70,000. I mean, this stuff is, is rampant and, and Secure the Village is all about the things we can do in this community spirit to, to kind of make a difference. Today's webinar being just one example of, of what we're doing and, and, and what we see as, as the opportunity here. Uh, which gets us back to, to you, Nicole, you know, on, 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 on this piece of it. Let's, let's spend a couple of minutes talking about you and your background and, and, you know, kind of what led you to write this book. So let me ask you that question. Yeah. yeah and let me just say, I mean, I think the two, two most important statistics that we should be sharing all the time are these 85% of critical infrastructures owned by the private sector. The government has very little visibility into it. We saw what happened by one company's IT network, not even their OT network, um, getting hit with ransomware, you know, as an economy after Colonial Pipeline, the Department of Energy had this confidential assessment that we got our hands on in the days after Colonial Pipeline that said as an economy, the US can't handle more than two more days of this pipeline being down. You know, that was one hack. But so so it's really important to 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 highlight that sort of structural challenge we have as a free market economy. But the other big statistic you just said that we should be repeating all over the place is that 44% 
of our economy is small and medium sized businesses. And they don't have the, the mini intelligence agencies that the banks have in this space or the threat intelligence, um, or in a lot of cases, even multi-factor authentication um, is not as seamless for them to turn on as, as we'd like. And so that's where I really see the value in Secure the Village, you know, that they can really kind of help close that gap, um, I think is, is critical. So, okay, back to me, you know, why did I write this book? Okay, so, you know, I, I like I said, I joined the Times in 2009, 2010. Um, I didn't realize it until the last couple of years, but uh, I, I was covering the post Stuxnet era. Um, that's really what my beat became. So, you know, I was hired to cover cybersecurity as a tech beat or business beat, which meant, you know, what's semantics earnings like this quarter um, or who are they acquiring? And then very quickly what happened was the Times was hacked by a Chinese APT. <laughs> And I got a tip from someone on the security team. It wasn't even assigned to me. And I thank God, you know, I just was able to embed with them to a certain extent and watch the guy we came to call the Beijing summer intern roll into our networks at 9 a.m. Beijing time and roll out around five in what we ultimately determined was a search for sources for some of the investigative reporting that my colleagues were doing in China around the Chinese ruling family and corruption therein. And it just completely opened my eyes to this new reality we are, we are living in now every single day of, oh my God, private companies and journalists are now expected to defend ourselves from advanced Chinese level nation state hackers. You know, this is the new, <laughs> this is our new reality. Yeah. And I dedicated yeah. several years to that topic and um, really to kind of changing the conversation from one of pure victim blaming, which is what, what the story was when I first got to the Times. It was like the same old story. LinkedIn didn't salt and hash their passwords and this and that. And sure, we can hit them on the head for that. But really, there was a larger conversation to be had about the fact that truly any American company or media organization with any IP um, or any kind of sensitive communications were, was a target. And, and not just for China anymore, but increasingly a whole host of, of state-sponsored hackers and APTs and then increasingly cyber criminals. And so that really became my mission, was to tell this story and to tell it in a way that the average Times reader could understand. And from that little perch, what I saw was, listen, the the attacks are coming from corners of the globe that we never expected to get there that this quickly. You know, that, that 2009 intelligence estimate I referenced earlier said, okay, there's China, there's Russia, but then there's Iran and North Korea. And, you know, we know they have the will to do us harm, but they don't have the capabilities. Well, 10 years later, everyone who signed off on that intelligence estimate will readily concede that they were wrong, that they learned after the Saudi Aramco attack that, you don't need a Stuxnet uh, to do a lot of harm. You can actually paralyze the world's richest company with rudimentary wiping code um, and, and then later DDoS attacks. So the threat, the threat landscape was changing significantly. And from what I could see, there wasn't a lot of there, there were there wasn't any cavalry in this space. You know, I, I remember the day the FBI came to the New York Times, you have this feeling as a citizen and definitely as a journalist of like, okay, who done it? You know, here's our logs. When are you going to get these guys in handcuffs? Um, where, when are we going to see these indictments? And that never happened. You know, it, fortunately later we actually did end up indicting some and, and et cetera, but that never happened. And it really is being left to individuals and companies themselves to defend themselves, like I said. But then there was this, this thing where I here I am in Silicon Valley and Mark Andreessen is talking about software is gonna eat the world. And that was starting to happen, but no one was thinking twice or pausing to reflect on the security ramifications. You know, in fact, Jack Dorsey came to the New York Times uh, and I happened to be in New York that week. And so I sat in on this session and he, he, he was there to talk about Square, 
um, mm-hmm. his payment business. And I raised my hand and I said, you know, aren't you worried about the security vulnerabilities here? I see people finding bugs in the software all over the place. Couldn't this be the death knell for, for Swear? And his response I'll never forget was, yeah, those security people like to whine a lot. And that was really what the thinking was, was security people are whiners. They're annoying. You know, we're just going to ignore them and, and stay with, stay on course here. So no one was thinking about security. And then the other thing that was really bothering me was the trade-off we were making in government. You know, we'd all heard whispers of a zero day market that US government agencies were buying into to to buy these vulnerabilities and not so they could get them patched, but leave them open for their own counterintelligence and um, war planning uh, someday. And okay, maybe that was fine two decades ago when we had this incredible first mover advantage, but now what I was seeing was uh, that first mover advantage is closing. You know, Russia is now coming that we're catching them hacking our nuclear plants. We're catching them hacking our utilities, our oil and gas companies. China, we've caught in these hacks of our pipelines. And Iran and North Korea are no, nothing to sneeze at or laugh at anymore. So uh, we might want to rethink this policy of leaving these holes open Uh, particularly holes that could lead to an attack on our critical infrastructure. And that's when I decided to write the book. Mm -hmm. And I knew I had to write it in a way that I could, my mom could understand. (laughs) Um, And I knew that I would have to, unfortunately, it was very uncomfortable to put the words I and me in the book or even in the title. This is how they tell me the world ends. But uh, I knew that, that to do this right, I was going to have to hold the reader's hand and say, look, look, I'm not technical either. You know, I was, I was thrown into the deep end on this one. I didn't choose it, but here I am. And I need to hold your hand and show you what's happening over here. And the trade-offs that are being made in the name of national security at the cost of cybersecurity. And I need to start showing you that actually cybersecurity and national security are one in the same now. So we're actually making trade-offs on on our national security. And if we're going to continue to leave this conversation to the people in the know, uh, we're not going to get very far because look, the problem keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, So we need to break this open to the the average policymaker who really doesn't have a deep level of technical understanding. We need to break it open to other fields of thought, like epidemiologists who might have something interesting to say about patient zero and the way these viruses spread um, and, and, you know, a whole host of other people that I think would have very strong feelings about the fact that we are leaving holes open rather than shutting them down. Um, And so that became my mission and it took me seven years and things happened during those seven years that were like the worst case scenario. You know, we never got to the cyber induced cataclysmic boom. You know, everyone has very strong feelings about the word cyber Pearl Harbor. So I studiously avoid it. But what we did get was the NSA's own stockpile of zero day exploits Mm -hmm. were hacked by someone. We don't even know who they are to this day. Uh, You know, Russia picked them up and used them in the not Petya attack which created an existential crisis for companies like Merck and Pfizer and Maersk. Uh, You know, we saw increasingly sophisticated attacks on our critical infrastructure. We saw the rise of Iran and North Korean hackers and then ransomware um, and, you know, loosely tied ransomware to state nation states. So all of these things were happening and I felt like, okay, this is the month I'm going to finally finish my book. And then something huge would happen. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it was like calling the publisher and saying, never mind, it's going to be a few months. Wow. And actually, um, fun fact I don't often share is that my first publisher canceled on me. Oh. And they said, sorry, you know, we've given you too much, too much leeway already with this deadline. We're out. And fortunately, another publisher picked it up. And was like, wow, this guy's made a mistake. <laughs> we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna stick with you for however long it takes to do this story right. And I, I got a, I fortunately got some some emails from the former publisher saying, wow, we made a mistake here. Yeah. So you know, at the end of the day, um, it wasn't perfect, my book, um, but. 
but I've been really hardened to see that some of the recommendations I made have been put into policy just in the last year. I mean, we blacklisted NSO group. I never thought I would see the day. We, um, you know, came to a settlement, but we indicted the former NSA hackers that became mercenaries for, for the Emirates. Um, we, you know, have new thinking around the NSA disclosing zero days and, and putting out mm-hmm. kind of urgent notices and saying, get this patched because we're seeing evidence that other nation states are using it. Like those disclosures are coming a lot more quickly and publicly than we've ever seen them. And we're finally seeing this administration make cybersecurity a priority in a way that we just haven't seen until now. So I've been really hardened to see the impact. Um, yeah. And of course, I'm, I'm freaked out <laughs> on Ukraine. <laughs> you know, the book starts in Ukraine. Yeah. And here we are uh, in this incredible moment that most of us never thought we would see in our lifetimes. And... Um, you know, we're all waiting to see what the real cyber implications are uh, of Russia's invasion and, and p- potential re- retaliation against the West for for the support that we're offering now. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, w- w- what you say is, first of all, it's, it's so relevant because of Ukraine. I mean, and it, it brings us to that. Um, but what... I also, I mean, when I read your book, and now I'm, I'm one of those who understands it. I mean, I when you tell the story, the, the story you did, uh, you know, just of of uh, the Twitter thing, you know, we're whiners, you know, yeah. brought me back. This is like mid '80s. I'm a security engineer, and in one of the aerospace companies, the Air Force dropped on us all the designs for I forget which F fighter it was, but all the, the telecom, telecommunications for the planes and, of course, out to the ground and everything. They came to us and says, okay, we got it all designed, now secure it. And we basically laughed at them. You know, it's like, you don't do it that way. You start with security as among your requirements and you work your way through, you know. And it's like, particularly, again, I'm going to talk about the 44%, you know, not knowing these kinds of things and, and just not having this, this kind of holistic perspective. How do we build security into our, into our system? Uh, which is a good segue, purposely done, uh, for our, our second break. And in our second break, we're going to bring on some of our, our sponsors. We're here only because of the financial uh, wherewithal of organizations that support us. And I want to call them out, give them an opportunity to say a couple of words as well. Uh, first off is, is one of our board members, uh, uh, Jordan Fisher. She's a lawyer, an attorney, uh, privacy focused. She's with Beckage, uh, a national law firm, and, and also an uh, international law firm, actually, and also on the board of Secure the Village. So if we can bring uh, Jordan on to, for a moment. Uh, I guess, yeah. Uh, thank you, Stan. I just want to say thank you to Nicole for joining us today. This is incredibly fascinating. We're very excited to be able to sponsor this. I thoroughly enjoyed your book and just love this conversation. So appreciate everything that you do and that Secure the Village does. So thank you so much. Super. Thanks. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks for your support. Though. Truly, truly, truly. Second sponsor, also on the legal side, uh, the California Lawyers Association. We are so grateful to them for jumping in and helping us and uh, looking forward to, to doing more work with the California lawyers. One of the, the pieces, it was, it's, it's, once I started getting my head out of the technology and looking around more broadly, it's, it seems to me that there's three critical players in, in, in cybersecurity. There's obviously the operational folks, the, the stuff that we do, but there's also the lawyers and the, the insurance people. So we're really happy to have the California Lawyers Association, Scott Kohler of the law firm Baker, uh, Baker Hostetler. Uh, good to see you, and thanks for your support, Scott. Absolutely, thank you for thank you for having us. And uh, you know, the California Lawyers Association is one of a one of the largest state, statewide uh, voluntary bar associations. Uh, we're we're proud to sponsor this event. Really, our mission is to kind of bring together various uh, privacy practitioners through these unique educational opportunities and the exchange of ideas and technical know how. Um, and all of this is coming from kind of our um, from the legal side and uh, you know, one of the, the many lawyers that uh, that are in this field. 
you know, in the California Lawyers Association first established the privacy law section in 2020, relatively recently. And uh, just this past year, we've established a subcommittee on cybersecurity and another committee on ad tech. So um, it just highlights the, the growing area of importance of, of cybersecurity. And, and we welcome all anyone who's interested in, in the privacy law, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to, to uh, consider joining. Super. Well, we will be working with you in, in the days, weeks, months, and, and, and years ahead uh, to, to move this thing along. Uh, another sponsor uh, is the IEEE. Uh, these are engineers and all. This is the uh, Orange County Computer Society. Uh, I, I'm ex IEEE. I mean, when I got out of the technology realm, it made it no longer made sense to to stay in, involved there. But I have the highest of respect for them and and are grateful for their support as well. Um, and then uh, for the final sponsor, our platinum sponsor, uh, Miller Kaplan uh, CPA firm in in uh, uh, the North Hollywood area, and then offices around the the uh, the West Coast. Uh, and most specifically, I, I've worked with with David Lamb for good gods twenty years or so. Uh, he's known to those who know us well as my arch nemesis, as I'm his arch nemesis. This is how we've built our relationship over the years. David, so grateful for your support and Miller Kaplan's support as our platinum sponsor. Well, Stan, a big congratulations to you and the Secure the Village board for all the amazing work you're doing. It's it's so fun uh, watching watching you progress. And, you know, it makes me think back to all the InfoSec pioneer stories that, that you've shared with us as a uh, you know, as 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 we learn uh, learned about information security, and and uh, you know, to to get to work with you as my friend, you know, colleague and, and teacher has been uh, I've been very fortunate. Um, it's Miller Kaplan's honor to get to sponsor Secure the Village as uh, as the platinum sponsor, and we love what you're doing, uh, Nicole. Uh, uh, we're so grateful for the work you're doing. The, we talk always about the awareness. And, you know, speaking of information security pioneers, I love the part in the epilogue of your book uh, where you refer to Dave Retz, who in 1976, you know, demonstrated that that first connection of networks. And the the quote is, everything is vulnerable. And we want to get, it's so important to get this message out because people don't understand. So I love, I love the way you wrote the book, how, how, you know, how well put together it is and how, you know, your mom could read it because that's what's important to us is how do we get regular people to understand those holes and how to close them. So, so thank you for, for that gift to us. Super. Thank, thank you, David. I mean, thank, thanks truly to, to you. Um, for, for those who don't know, David and I and, and Kimberly Pease, who's also here, built a business, uh, Citadel Information Group, uh, helping mid-sized and smaller companies with cybersecurity, which we sold. Uh, a couple of years ago to to Miller Kaplan, and we're still part of that team. And, you know, we're in day in, day out with with the the businesses, again, mostly the smaller ones that that need this kind of support. Uh, Back back to our our discussion with with you, Nicole. Uh, You mentioned the NSO group and and, and Pegasus, and they're still in the news this last week. Uh, We, uh, there was a report that the Spanish prime minister, was it, that had been uh, his iPhone had been taken over uh, by some enemies. You want to talk about that? It so, kind of segue I mean, into election yeah. security, disinformation, all of that. Yeah. I'll be totally negligent and tell you all that I had a horrific case of COVID. <laughs> so oh. don't ask me about anything that happened in the last uh, couple of weeks. But, um, but yes, I think I didn't read the whole story there. There's been some great reporting on NSO recently. Um, Ronan Farrow, you know, to the mm-hmm. point about security people aren't whiners anymore. They're celebrities. Well, now, you know, Ronan Farrow moved from Me Too to Pegasus and NSO group. You know, everyone wants to be covering this space. Um, and I think the story you're referring to is there was, well, I don't know if it was the Spanish prime minister's phone, because honestly, I, I didn't go deep on this because I was just trying to, uh, get through this with my also COVID infected three year old, but um, there was a lot of use of Pegasus on Catalan people, um, you know, in 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 Spain and and perhaps ahead of the the elections around giving um, Catal- Catalonia independence. So I'm not your expert on that, but 
again, you know, it's just clear that this spot, I'll back up and say, my, my uh, journey, let's call it with NSO started off because a source, you know, just to give you a sense of how critical sources are, uh, showed up at my house at someone I had talked to for a long time, never someone I'd quoted, but someone who was just kind of a sounding board showed up at my house um, met me in my little garden shed, which I am in now. It is officially my COVID office, uh, mm-hmm. pandemic office, and just said, um, I'm going to show you some documents and I want you to take pictures of them. You can print them out and then you need to figure out how to delete every trace of them from your phone and your printer, et cetera. And so I did. And then he said, all right, that's it. I'm not going to offer any context. I'm just going to let you do your thing. And what they were, were, it was the first time anyone had seen sort of any kind of um, communication between NSO and its customers. And it detailed sort of the relationships and financial compensation um, that NSO was getting from governments like Mexico and the UAE. And those were its first customers Mm -hmm. um, outside Israel. And so uh, that just led me on, you know, basically like a four or five year journey where I was covering constant instances of abuse of NSO spyware on journalists, phones. Um, It was being used as an intimidation tactic in a lot of cases. I I wrote about how a lot of people in Mexico, journalists, uh, even um, nutritionists who were advocating for a soda tax in Mexico would get these these SMS messages and then with a link and when they'd click on the link, it would lead them to Galloso, this Mexican funeral service. Um, and you know, when they start, wouldn't click on these, their kids would start getting the messages, even if their kids were inside the United States. So mm-hmm. it just was clear. This was an intimidation technique, uh, that there, it was being used for corrupt purposes. You know, why was, why were people in Mexico using spyware on nutritionists who were advocating for soda tax? Clearly someone was getting kickbacks from the soda industry somewhere. Um, and then in the UAE it was even more disturbing because the targets of of NSO's Pegasus spyware were finding themselves locked up in solitary confinement, like Ahmed Mansour, who's still in solitary confinement to this day, simply for advocating for uh, greater voting rights there. So just over and over, you know, just one source kind of led me down this journey where I just started exposing this horrific abuse um, of these tools and, you know, I got to know NSO along the way. And I talk about how they would put me on these extremely awkward conference calls <laughs> where I would ask a question like, okay, you know, would Turkey, you know, cause they, they talk about how they have this whole matrix where they determine who to. Ah, you just went away again. She'll be right back. I'm sure. Uh, I wonder if it's the NSO group hacking this event. To- I know, I'm back. I'm starting to wonder who it is because it's just yeah. too too frequent. Okay, I'll come on in the video in a second. Sorry. Yeah, about that. no problem. So, uh, yeah, so just long story short, um, you know, I would have these interactions with NSO where they would pledge over and over again that they had this matrix and that they took human rights records and press freedoms into account when they were vetting customers, that they would get a license from, from the Israeli government to do it too. But over and over again, we just saw abuse after abuse after abuse. And so, I'm glad uh, to see that they've been blacklisted, but I do think that NSO probably has a point when mm. they say that by blacklisting us, you're conceding this whole market to companies in governments like uh, in countries like Russia and China. And yeah. Iran. So well, we'll and, see what yeah. Go ahead. Finish the thought. Sorry. I was just say so. We'll see what happens with that. Yeah. Yeah. No. And and, and what you say is so true. I mean, NSO Group is not the only that does this. Uh, and again, going back to my own, you know, my mathematical days, my early days, you know, looking at the underlying foundations of, of, of information security and the fact that um, just it is mathematically too complex for us to write software without vulnerabilities. And uh, we're, they're going to be with us just like we have genetic defects. I mean, you can almost think of it in, in some ways that, that same way. Uh, if not NSO group, then someone else, and then someone else, and then someone else, which, you know, 
brings us back to the the defense side, the cyber care side, if you will, uh, which is a, another segue. I want to do one more thing before we bring you back on, uh, which is talk about some of the other nonprofits that are in this space. We're not alone as a nonprofit here. Uh, there are uh, there's a, a new organization called Nonprofit Cyber that was just recently set up. Uh, that uh, Secure the Village is a, a member of. There are 31 other members of, of uh, nonprofit cyber as well. And we're all about, you know, how do we collaborate better? How do we share better? How do we, as I like to say, mathematician that I am, how do we make one in one a thousand? How do we leverage our work this way? And, and, and that's so important. Four very specific nonprofits I want to call out. Uh, Thanks, Julie. Thanks, thanks for bringing this up, this slide. Uh, the Cyber Readiness Institute uh, works mostly with, with small and medium-sized businesses, the smaller businesses. They have a cyber leader program you can sign up for and, and, and take. It, it's, a, it's an actual training program that you get a certificate at the end of it. It's not technical. It's a leadership management uh, certificate, if, if you will. And I urge the people in the executive suite whatever company you're in, somebody in that suite needs to have responsibility for security, cybersecurity, and that person really needs to be uh, go through the, the Cyber Readiness Institute Cyber Leader Program. Uh, next one, the Cyber Crime Support Network, dealing mostly with victims of cyber crime and also helping law enforcement. Just, you know, right now, if, if let's say my car is broken into or my house is broken into, the police can come and they can get down a checklist of this happened, this happened, this happened, and know exactly what laws apply. And, you know, we can begin to do statistics on those laws and all. That doesn't exist in cybersecurity. And part of the function of the Cybercrime Support Network is to build that build that kind of a, a database, if you will. And also just a lot of support to, that I mentioned earlier, uh, the mother of a, a colleague uh, who, who was reached, I reached out to Cybercrime Support Network when that happened. It got some really useful information from them. Uh, Sightline Security is another nonprofit. Sightline is a nonprofit that works with nonprofits to help them better secure themselves. Because we all know nonprofits are on the one side, They've got a lot of sensitive information, whether it's donor information, if, if they're in healthcare, those kinds of places, it's, uh, it's real sensitive, personal, personally identifiable information, health information, and so on. And they don't have resources. Their IT resources are often limited because budgets are, are so tight with our nonprofits. And with IT resources being limited, that means even more so information security resources are limited. Um, and then finally, uh, U.S. Valor, and I acknowledge I'm on their uh, adv advisory board, as I'm on the uh, Small Business Advisory Board of, of Cyber Readiness Institute also. U.S. Valor holds a unique place in, 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 in my heart. They're doing two things at once. On the one side, they've got an intern program uh, for uh, people transitioning into cybersecurity. And you may not know it, but we're short uh, several hundred thousand cybersecurity workers at this time. So anything we can do to increase the supply of cybersecurity people is, is, is a good thing. It's a win-win-win. And the other is U.S. Valor specifically working with veterans, uh, people who have defended our country and who are now back uh, looking for, okay, so what do I do post being in the in the Defense Department, what do I do when I I leave military service? And U.S. Valor is right in that space. So very very grateful to uh, to all all four of these and and to others as as well. As I said, there's 31 members of of nonprofit cyber, and you know we're we're all in this doing what we can to 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 help, if you will. Um, so back back to you, Nicole. Uh, let's look forward looking. Okay, we've, we've kind of talked about the situation as it currently is right now. Um, what do you see in five years? Where's this whole thing going? Uh, not that it's easy to make prognostications and no, we're not going to hold you to this, but just give us your sense of what's going on. Okay, this is my least favorite question so far. <laughs> um, but so, you know, I, 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 it's hard to think out five years, but just in the months and year to come, you know, I unfortunately predict that there will at some point 
be some Russian retaliation for our collective response on Ukraine. And I think the most likely mode of retaliation is cyber because you know it, it can be used as a short of war tool. I also think it can be used as a powerful psychological and political tool. I mean, I keep repeating colonial pipeline, so I apologize, but you know, we all are seeing what's happening with gas prices right now, but we still have a lot of bipartisan support for what this administration is doing in terms of Ukraine. Will we still have that level of bipartisan support if gas prices climb astronomically, um, not just from shortages, et cetera, but from maybe a coordinated attack, cyber attack or ransomware attacks uh, on American pipeline organizations and operations? I don't know. You know, that could be a, a powerful way for Russia to turn up the heat so that maybe our appetite for sending all of these weapons and, and dollars and the bans on Russian oil and vodka, et cetera, uh, you know, might not be what it is today or what it was a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So that's where my main concern is right now. You know, Putin is not the type of guy to just sit back and take it. <laughs> At a certain point, he's going to respond. And I think, um, you know, based on sort of the evolving intelligence based on this new revelation around uh, the Swiss army knife of industrial uh, hacking tools that were, was recently discovered by uh, and announced by the Department of Energy and the NSA and Dragos and other private sector organizations. You know, they're not developing those for fun. Uh, yeah. Let's just put it that way. And so I think we're in for some short-term pain um, is the bad news. I think the good news is I've never seen uh, more outreach, uh, more collab from, from everyone on this issue. I've never been asked to speak to more boards to do kind of cyber awareness and cyber education. A, a women's lunch luncheon group in New Jersey had me on and were asking me about zero days and, and defining zero days for this mm -hmm. women's lunch group in New Jersey. You know, lay people want to know what they should be doing right now. And the other positive development is this administration is not letting this crisis go to waste. I've never seen, we're nowhere near where we need to be, sure, but I've never seen this level of public-private collaboration as I'm seeing right at this very moment uh, because of Ukraine. You know, whether it's Microsoft discovering the wiping uh, malware, calling up the White House, contacting their counterparts in Poland, getting it off these networks, the discovery of this pipe dream or whatever we're calling it tool before it could be deployed and warning the critical infrastructure sectors about it, the um, you know Ukraine with our help and resources and private companies resources discovering in destroyer at these substations before Russia could shut the power off to millions of people. Mm -hmm. This is all because of that public private collaboration that we've all been talking about for such a long time, but we never actually got there. And it's not perfect, but wow, I didn't expect to see this much progress or this level of collaboration so quickly. So there's real, real op, you know, modes of optimism here. Um, it's not just totally doom and gloom. And then I think, you know, eventually if Russia responds with destructive cyber attacks, um, I think that we will eventually probably see some form of a digital or cybersecurity equivalent of Sarbanes-Oxley mm -hmm. that says kind of enough is enough. Um, you know, the government is going to have to step in here and make these NIST requirement, uh, requirements, um, you know, a legal standard that companies have to meet, uh, particularly those in critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And I have sort of mixed feelings about it. You know, unfortunately, I think the, the U.S. has a terrible track record when it comes to developing nuanced mm -hmm. cyber legislation, the Computer yeah. Fraud and Abuse Act being, you know, the number one example of that. So that's where I say to all of you in the audience, get engaged right now, you know, on, on these topics and, and on 
uh, you know, the nuances of the regulation so that we don't end up with just another compliance checklist or something that doesn't actually move the needle very much. Um, you know, that's really where I see a real opportunity for those in this space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, well said. I mean, this whole challenge, as you just alluded to, of, of you know, we can all the regulations and they're compliant. Regulations are compliance focused. Check the box. You know, we're doing these things. And one of the things we've learned in cybersecurity, there was a recent article, the Navy discovered this. Uh, we, we posted that in our news of the week not too long ago, that cybersecurity is about management and leadership and all culture, yeah. all the things that don't neatly fit into boxes right. you know, outside the box. And, and, and those are the things we, we, we have to worry about, have to be concerned about uh, very, very, and, it, it, it seems to me, and I want to get your feedback on this as well, that just as, as citizens now, given the circumstances, all of us have got to raise our game, so to speak. We've all got to, you know, we're going to go into the voting booth in November. Uh, on the one side, we can expect there's going to be, uh, I, I'd be very surprised if, if there are not attempts by Putin with disinformation campaigns and so on to disrupt this election. And at the same time, you know, we're gonna have to make decisions, elect people that are gonna support, you know, I mean, there's all yeah. the Solarium Commission stuff and, and, and all of that. Getting, we're losing a lot of those people, a lot of Republicans who did get religion on cybersecurity have said they are not planning to run for re-election. Yeah. So that is actually a pretty urgent um, development, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, you know, frankly, you know, cybersecurity, I joke, it's like the the last, I think there's only really three bipartisan issues left. <laughs> I think it's daylight savings. <laughs> okay. I just voted to change that. China, to some extent, and cybersecurity. And mm -hmm. sometimes it gets politicized. You know, we saw Rick Scott um, hold up the disclosure requirements that had a lot of bipartisan support, you know, where critical infrastructure companies will have to disclose when they've been breached within a certain time range. Um, so sometimes it gets sort of messed up in politics, but for the most part, it's still a bipartisan issue. Cross our fingers as if that might work. <laughs> it stays bipartisan. Who, who knows in, in, in today's, in, in, in today's world. Um, this has been great, Nicole. I mean, it, 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 it's really what a fabulous discussion. I'm grateful to you for it. I want to segue now to our last half hour, bring on a few other panelists and talk about, you know, how do we tell this story now? Let's collectively think again, secure the village is all about it takes the village to secure the village. So I want to bring in some other people. Uh, two of whom you've already met, David Lamb and Scott Kohler. Let's let's bring David and Scott on. And and the others, my good friend, uh, the the founder, executive director of Sightline Security, Kelly Masada. Um, and, and so um, basically it's, how do we tell this story? And it, cause it's, it's technical and so many people still think, oh, the, security, that's an IT problem. And this whole last hour has been, no, it's not an IT problem. It's only it has an IT component. It's bigger than that. Actually, I remember saying that, reading that in a book uh, that was published like 20 years ago on the CISSP certification and what, what all that was about. Uh, and I mean, it was true back in the 80s when I was in the aerospace industry then as well. Um, so how do we get this story out? How do we have more impact? How do I'm in Hollywood? How do we get Hollywood to tell this story? I mean, we got the greatest storytellers in the world, uh, you know, all within 10 miles of where I'm sitting. You know, how do we do this? So let's bring on the other panelists. Uh, I'm going to give you the first word on that, Nicole, and then ask our, our panelists and uh, Julie, if you could bring them all on, on screen as well, spotlight them. But Nicole, get us started on, the, on this side of the discussion. Well, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. You know, I think the number one thing is know your audience. And I think for too long, the cybersecurity industry sort of ignored the fact that this really is a whole of society problem and would get kind of hung up on the jargon. And I think rightly in a lot of cases, critical of anyone articulating what the potential impacts of this threat could be and sort of dismissing it as FUD. 
And I think they're still FUD, right? We still have a FUD marketing problem. Slow down, excuse me. Just re- tell people what FUD is if they don't know. So just, yeah. Right. So yeah. FUD is, like it stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And I think for a long time, uh, cybersecurity companies in particular, the large ones, made whole entire marketing campaigns around, around stoking fear to basically get more customers, right? And so it became sort of this dirty thing that if you were articulating that you know, there could be a cyber attack that brought down the grid, for instance, or made it impossible to get cash out at the ATM, you were somehow this like FUD person who should be immediately <laughs> shamed and dismissed. And I think that that was fair for some time, but I think it's, uh, it's a lot more nuanced than that. And I think we should be articulating uh, the potential impacts of these attacks. And I think the way to tell that story is just to lay out what's already happened, you know, in short, in just recent history with um, not Petya, you know, people couldn't get yeah. money out of the ATMs. They couldn't pay for gas at the gas stations. Merck had to tap into the CDC's emergency supplies of the Gardasil vaccine because their vaccine production was held up. Pfizer still was on the hook for $500 million in damages because their insurer wouldn't cover it under the war exemption clause in their policy. So I don't think we have to like scare people with, with hypotheticals anymore. I think we just have to lay out very clearly, this is what has happened. You haven't seen it yet because it hasn't come here yet. But oh, by the way, the US is now the most frequently targeted country in the world, you know, we are the, the biggest target of sophisticated attacks. That is, that was just in Microsoft's report that they published last week. Um, that is a part of it. On Hollywood, I'll tell you, one of the fun things that has happened is that my book was optioned for scripted and is now being optioned for unscripted, which means a documentary too. And so mm-hmm. I've a lot about this problem of how do you tell this story on film and it's been a real challenge for Hollywood over the years I've had a number of stories at the times optioned but the challenge is always how do you tell the story without it just being one guy in front of his computer doing this with a hoodie on and Mm -hmm. that's really there's no excuse to, to dismiss a project like this because of that anymore because we do see these very real impacts so you know quick spoiler alert you know the 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 plot line we're playing with is a critical infrastructure, you know, a company that provides software to critical infrastructure. There's a woman at the company who learned that they've been hacked by a China or Russia and uh, is worried about the potential implications for critical infrastructure, but she learns the company is trying to bury it. She goes out and ends up finding this kind of Jim Gosler grandfather of cyber war type characters says, oh, honey, you know, this is just a drop in the bucket. (laughs) You're not the only one that's been hacked. It's all of these organizations. And it kind of leads her on this journey to understand just how much of a foothold our adversaries have into software that touches critical infrastructure. So it's a way of telling Mm -hmm. the story without someone just sitting in front of their screen through people. I mean, for my book, it was really important to me because it's a highly technical uh, subject that each part of the zero day market, at least in the beginning, uh, was told through one human. Um, and that's how I structured it. Each chapter for the most mm-hmm. part, one human who could walk the reader through that slice of the market and that slice of the threat. And I think that is a really effective thing. Just tell the story through humans, the old fashioned way. Um, <laughs> it is yeah. really I think, the best way to go. Yeah, no, and I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we, it's, it's, it's buried deep in our either our cultural or maybe even our genes that we are storytellers. And I think the Iliad and the Odyssey. I mean, going back and corresponding things in China and India and and well, so and on. Last thing yeah. I'll say on this is um, companies understand this now. So mm-hmm. at Google, one of the first things that happens when you join now is Heather Adkins or someone like her walks new employees through the Aurora attack and Mm -hmm. says like, here's how it happened. It started with one employee clicking on a phishing link and it here's where it ended. It ended with China China getting access to dissidents Gmail accounts. In Mm -hmm. other words, it is on you to 
think about security and those dissidents with everything you're doing at this organization because you could be patient zero. And I think that is terrific, you know, that that, that is now part of the onboarding process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that absolutely is. And it's it's a segue. Kelly, I'm going to ask you because you're you're telling this story to nonprofits and typically smaller nonprofits as as well. Um, so how do you navigate this space or what's what's your strategy for helping a nonprofit kind of get it, if you will? Yeah, and, and actually, uh, hello from the National Conference of the Boys and Girls Club. Um, if you want to sort of get perspective on nonprofits, come to a conference where there's 2,000 people who are missioned for good and doing great things in the world. Um, you know, we see three really critical things about how to help nonprofits and others think about cybersecurity. The first is they're fatigued. We're all fatigued by the past two years, but even before that, end users and folks that we want to sort of bring into the fold are tired of talking to us. They don't want to talk to security people. Um, So they're tired of it. The second part is that the language is still complicated. The more that the media talks encryption and breaches and ransomware, all these things that the average person doesn't understand the more that they're going to sort of keep us in a box and keep us over there. We want to be like them. You know, we form Sightline as a nonprofit to serve other nonprofits because we wanted to be like them. We wanted to show that we could actually step into their shoes. And I think the language barrier in our industry is really complicating that. And in my days at the Tor Project and listening to Nicole, thank you for your work, um, my, my days at the tour project came up for me quite a lot as I was hearing you speak. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember talking to the journalists and, you know, the life and death situations that they were dealing with. Um, and I think the last piece for us is that they feel disconnected from it. So there's a disconnect with how they see cybersecurity. You know, if it doesn't happen to you or if it doesn't happen to someone close to you, or if it doesn't have a huge impact on your life, then why? Why am I going to spend the time thinking about it? So at Sightline, we work very hard in taking the specialness out of cybersecurity, and we're talking about it as it's just kind of smart to do, not that it's going to save you or not that it's going to protect you 100%. It's just smart. Um, And if you take one step forward, you're better off than you were before you took that step. Yeah. No, that, that's a good point. That's a segue over to you, David, as, as, as well, because we, you and I have talked a lot over the, the years, and we've seen a lot over the years as, as well. Uh, as a company begins to get its arms around its cybersecurity management, it begins to realize other efficiencies in its whole IT capability, uh, you know, we're, we're managing this stuff better now. And I, I'm, I'm curious, I wanted to say, hear you jump in and say a, a, a few words about this. And you're muted, so. You, you can't go through a, a post-COVID video conference without the you're muted statement. So I'm glad to have contributed <laughs> that to the group. Um, I, th- this is absolutely true. And it's an interesting intersection between, you know, the, the process side and, and, you know, and, and the business operations side. Um, and it's true across the business operation. So it's not just a technical issue. It's that when you optimize processes, things get done over and over again. Nicole talked about, you know, at Google, you always get this orientation, right? We know that a basic fundamental part of information security is the education of the end users. Well, what ends up happening is if we follow these standards, which, you know, since uh, everyone knows we're a nemesis, so I can make my crack about you being older than God. Um, (laughs) Since, since, you know, we're starting from the eighties when all these standards, when you and you know, the rest of the pioneers were making these standards, we know there's the right thing to do. And we know that when we follow those processes, we get better at everything. And, and the best example of this is change management. 
One of the biggest issues we have, and we touched on it a little bit earlier, this is not something to be delegated from management to IT. This is, this is a, a large swath business issue. And so management says to IT, okay, go ahead and do it. IT does what it wants. And it's not following process. It's not making sure it's in alignment with security. Sometimes they did what happened to you. Hey, make it secure now. What we found is when we do those change management process and we follow the information security procedures, like these commercial reasonable procedures, like 91% of the problems go away. Forget about the security. It just gets better. And this is part of the education and following the process. And, and I love what Kelly said, and I love talking to Kelly about this because she really looks at how do I communicate this in a way that people can receive it? And it builds on what Nicole said. How do I communicate this in a way that people understand that this just is good sense and your business is going to get better for operating in a way that, you know, that, that follows common sense process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well said, very, very well said. Um, and it also raises then, of course, the next question mm -hmm. and, and guess what, Scott, that's off to you. Uh, Kimberly, Kimberly Pease are the third of what was Citadel, you know, now the, Head of the Miller Kaplan team uh, put in the uh, in, in the chat box and let me go grab it. Uh, uh, how do we get business leaders in the room to tell them the score story, Scott? And part of that's, of course, the the legal side. Yeah. I mean, the law can get the business leaders in the yeah. room. You know, yeah. so we're looking to you to do this. So give us some insight. Well, I, I will tell you from uh, everything that's been on the news, the, the Colonial Pipeline, the solar winds, that has done a phenomenal job of raising awareness and getting it because now you could see the bad publicity, you could see the impact on businesses. Uh, second of all, the other thing that, that really drives it home for a lot of the board of directors is this uh, uh, the cost associated with it. You know, back when we were handling ransomware years ago, you know, you'd have a, you know, a, a $300 ransom and now it's like three million dollars, or, or uh, uh, exponentially much more than that. So, um, being able to translate it into the dollars and cents, look, here is the impact that it's going to have on your organization. Uh, so, um, not only from a publicity side, from you know Colonial Pipeline, from the the ransomware side, or the multi million dollars uh, fees, um, to the the business interruption side. You know, you you look at like you know the city of Atlanta, where you know they were were down for you know weeks and weeks, and that alone. Um, causes a huge impact um, in terms of cost. N never mind the fact that it was a, a 50k ransom demand uh, causing uh, millions of dollars of damage. Yeah. Now, so that so that so we've got publicity side. We've got you know the dollars and cents. And the other thing that we found, and this is a direct result of um, just the amount of attention that that's being played to cybersecurity. The executive orders coming out of the White House. Um, we also see the SEC has is um, they're issuing fines against organizations and we see it re reflected in their proposed rules, which are actually pointing to say, look, you need to report cyber incidents as part of your AK filings on a regular basis. And not only that, but you need to now describe the cybersecurity expertise of your board members. Okay, because um, we feel that investors are going to look to that as part of, you know, their analysis of the organization. And we now expect you to not only um, provide the background of your board members who have cybersecurity, but also describe the cybersecurity processes that you have in place. And that, those are part of the SEC proposed rules that um, are open for comment right now. But mm -hmm. um, all, everything else being, <laughs> unless something major changes, we, we're going to see that in the near future. And it's just going to be part of the, rant, uh, of the disclosures of an organization. So I'm going to come back to you, Nicole, with the next question following up all of this. You know, the how do I say this? The elements to do what we need to do on a national level or here. I mean, Scott, you just described the legal ones. David, you've described, you know, the kind of that focus on process side and, you know, integrate security, reasonable security into it. And Kelly, you know, your idea of let's, you know, let's, let's go out and actually talk to people, you know, like boards and executive directors, which we're all doing. That's fine. And, and, but it's also slow. It's also, gee, it's incremental. Yes, in five years, we'll be better than we are today. And in 10 years, we'll even be better than we will be in five years. 
but we don't have five and 10 years. Putin's under the gun right now in Ukraine. You know, I mean, things could happen there like this quickly. Uh, something major happening here in America as, as a result of that. How do we how do we go faster? How do we speed this up? How do we get, you know, I don't even know how to ask that question. You know, how do we how do we just get this done? Yeah. So if you interview Paul Nakasone right now, General yeah. Nakasone, he'll say, you know, when we say what what is the thing that we can do that would really improve cybersecurity for the United States? He said, he says, help me make it as hard for our adversaries to operate here as it now is for me to operate there. And left unsaid, I think, is that China, you know, these countries that are not free market economies and largely authoritarian are using things like their great firewall to their advantage. And they're able to now detect anomalous activity on sensitive systems much more quickly than we are set up to do here because in a lot of cases, the best and brightest uh, cyber agencies like the NSA don't have insight into domestic traffic, nor do we really want them to. So how do we move things quickly? Well, I think the one major asset we have is that we are a free market economy. And so I think the answer to getting people to do things as quickly as possible is you create market incentives. And so one of the things I recommend in my book is I do think we should offer tax credits to organizations that can show that they've had a pen test and that over time they've improved or limited their attack surface. Why shouldn't we reward organizations for that? So I think that's one mode of entry. I think another one is what organizations like BitSight and Moody's are doing where you know, for years BitSight's been taking open source intelligence and sort of giving companies a score that then gets fed to insurance organizations or potential acquirers to give them a sense of what risk they're really taking on in a quantified way. And I think it's ridiculous that we don't have any quantified metrics around cyber risk. You know, we have FICO scores for people, we rate uh, mortgage pools questionably, it turned out, uh, but we should be assigning risk ratings to organizations we all know that you know everyone wants to get the A. So if you get a label that says your your security posture is D minus, <laughs> and this is going to go to your cyber insurer, or mm -hmm. this is going to go to any company you want to partner with or your customers, they're going to improve that score. They're going to do everything they can to improve that score. And so I think that is another way to go. And then the other thing is just on your kind of original story on or question on how do we tell this story? I mean. The story I always tell <laughs> that I think is the best one at shaking people out of their complacency, because, you know, the number one thing you hear when you're me and, and you interact with, with the normals, you know, they want to ask the New York Times cybersecurity reporter, well, what should I do? Or more, more often, why should I care? What would Putin mm -hmm. want with me? And yeah. the story I tell them is the following, which is, uh, you know, I met an organization, a company, a, a startup out in Silicon Valley that was made up of former NSA hackers who had seen all day long that China in particular was staging a lot of its attacks from compromised vulnerable servers inside the U.S. Mm -hmm. The NSA didn't have access to those servers or that traffic, but in the private sector, they could approach the owners of those systems or servers and say, hey, we, we believe you might have... <laughs> Chinese APTs in your server, you know, can we put a sensor on it and potentially block attacks at the source? And I, he, they told me the story and I said, okay, what's the weirdest place that, the, that there's one of these compromised servers that you're, you're picking up attacks and blocking them uh, at the source? And they said, well, there is this one mom and pop welding shop in Wisconsin. <laughs> so we went out to Wisconsin and I did mm -hmm. the story for the times and we knocked on the door and we said, hey, this is who these guys are. And we believe that your dusty backroom office server over there might be playing host to this Chinese state-sponsored hacking group. You know, could we take a look? And they said, sure. And they put a sensor on this server and lo and behold, it lit up with attacks on Harvard, on the top M&A lawyers in the country, on you know several of the Fortune 100. And I tell that story to say, okay, maybe they don't 
want to have you welder, right? But you could play a critical role in staving off an advanced nation state attack on some of our most vibrant organizations, research, and you know the crown jewels of our freedom and free market economy. So getting people to understand that they might not be the target, but they could be you know, the enabler mm-hmm. um, for these attacks, I think is a really important story to tell just to get through this. Well, what would they want with me? Why do I need to use multi-factor authentication? Why do I need to patch? my systems, you know, just telling that story as kind of a matter of almost like patriotism, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but also urgency is one I think is a really important story to tell. Yeah. Now that that's important. I mean, one of the things that strikes me about where we're at at this moment in history, not just on the cybersecurity side, but politically as, as well, um, you know, are we a nation of individuals each able to go do their own thing and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, or are we a nation, a community? You know, do we work together uh, on our on our challenges? Is there that opportunity to collaborate? I mean, I, I've i read, you know, I'm old enough to, not old enough to have lived through World War II. I was a little baby at the very beginning of it. But the fact that we all came together as a country then, uh, and the outcome was... You know, obviously we're here, right? Um, it, it seems in, until and unless we are able to do that in cyber, uh, the enemy is always going to have the upper hand because there are, you know, HVAC companies in Pennsylvania that give access to their target client. There are these companies in Wisconsin that can easily get hacked. You talk, okay, regulations around critical infrastructure. I don't know what percentage of the of the economy has nothing to do with critical infrastructure, but few of our clients do. Scott, I don't know. Law firms don't. You know, Kelly, how many nonprofits are critical infrastructure? Well, I I, I would interrupt you briefly, Stan, on that <laughs> one, because you, you know how I feel about this. Oh, yes. In my view, nonprofits are the other critical infrastructure, because when something goes bad in the world, It's going to be a nonprofit that's going to stand up and feed people, get people out of war zones, um, you know, shelter people in a natural disaster. So, you know, nonprofits aren't sort of in the corner, immune and safe from all these attacks. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when Scott mentioned the Atlanta gang hit with ransomware, there were nonprofits that were charged with feeding children that were caught up in that ransomware attack that were down for 30 days. That's 30 days of children not getting lunches. So, you know, when we talk about some of this stuff, it's not always the big money grabbers. Sometimes it really is about we will not be able to have the services to do the things like eat and le- and live and have gas, but it's it's bigger. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry. You no, know no. you're going to get me uh, riled up with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I I I I know you well, and I you know. Uh, but the, still, the point is whether or not nonprofits should be a critical infrastructure. They are not now listed as I, as a critical infrastructure. I believe you know. they are, but you know, yeah. again, there there's a yeah. there's a rub against you know, and and I. I disagree with Nicole on on some of the points, but I don't have a better solution around the story. (laughs) So it's like, how can I disagree without offering a better solution? Um, You know, if the government is going to be imposing a lot of controls and restrictions around cyber and information security on critical infrastructure, we're going to have to figure out a way to get nonprofits to kind of rise up to that as well. Mm -hmm. And that's that's going to be the challenge. Yeah. So it's a blessing and a curse. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. someone someone in the comments referenced Oldsmar, Florida, you know, the water treatment hack there. And that is the case that we should actually be talking about the most. You know, a hacker, we still don't know who they are, getting into this water treatment facility, upping the level of lie in the water, and it only getting caught because some engineer happened to watch his mouse creep across his his screen. And then there were these subsequent great stories by, by my competitors at NBC and a couple other outlets who looked at what is the cybersecurity posture of water treatment facilities. And a lot of them 
are owned by, you know, in some cases, nonprofits, some cases, mom and pops, um, and they are using legacy software. You know, it's the same old story. We all know the, the ending. Um, so, but that is an urgent national security threat. And that's mm-hmm. where this message of cybersecurity is national security. It's partly technical, but a lot of it is culture and basic cyber hygiene. Mm-hmm. And we're not doing basic cyber hygiene. So how do we improve that? Part of it's awareness. I still argue part of it's market incentives. And I do think ultimately part of it will be have to be regulation. Um, mm-hmm. But I, again, like, I don't want to see any regulation that looks anything like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act ever again. So that's where, you know, getting involved in these conversations and education is so critical. Yeah. Yeah, this is very definitely. Scott, do you have any thoughts on this? We're kind of to the bottom of the hour. Let's, yeah. No, I, I think we, I think we hit on on all the same topics. I mean, uh, hitting um, proper education and uh, um, legislation does go a long way to um, reinforcing some of these these issues and getting companies to take seriously. Um, I like the idea of, of of a tax credit that you discussed uh, early on, um, but uh, as opposed to tax credit, the other thing is you know tax penalty. Um, we've seen um, you know the private right of action being uh, imposed in a number of different pieces of legislation, like you know the CC uh, uh, the CPRA and the CCPA, where you know if you uh, are, are suffered a breach, um, then not only does, does the organization have to do notification. But they also are, are faced with this um, uh, lawsuits where they don't have to establish um, uh, damages associated with it, uh, which has been the number one defense for for most uh, firms that have been hit. And, and I feel like you know, a, as we see more and more of that type of legislation, um, it's it's going to become economical and a business decision where you can't avoid it. Where yes, e- even though you know a, a ransomware attack on a on a small mom and pop store is not going to have a major you know uh, impact to their business. Business, but lo and behold, if, if it results to some sort of breach or um, causes some other harm someplace else, then all of a sudden, yeah, it becomes serious. So, um, you know, it's it's really interesting to see how those uh, we might be able to motivate uh, organizations in different ways to um, to elevate their their security needs. Yeah, well, well said, David. I'll unmute this time. Oh, uh, please don't. I, I just I just want to express my gratitude uh, to you, to Nicole, for, for everyone who helped put this event together and, and really for the for the great work you're doing, Nicole, and getting this message out. Hmm. Definitely. Nicole, I'll be super grateful for for you you, you joining us. Um, I, before I give you the last word, I want to read something from our, one of our close friends, Alexa McCullough. Uh, in the chat box, he said, thank you, Nicole and Stan. I listened to this with my mother. We both thought this was fantastic. And I think, okay. yeah, that that touches me. I mean, you know, Alexa, you and I've known each other for, good God, several years now. Uh, but as we've talked, we've got to get out to the mothers and the fathers and the children. I mean, this is this is all hands on deck time, you know, if, if, if you will. So um, yeah. grateful, great, grateful that Perhaps we're accomplishing some of what we set out to to accomplish. Uh, and Nicole, uh, take us home. Final yeah, thoughts. I, mean, I think if I'm guilty of anything uh, at the New York Times, it was occasionally leaving people with this impression that cybersecurity has become like a military war fighting exercise over there. You know, the digital equivalent of of jets playing around around Taiwan and. And really what it is, is it's a whole of society problem that comes down to basic cyber hygiene and awareness um, and prioritizing cybersecurity at these organizations and doing the bare basics. And no, nothing is perfect. You know, we're never gonna get to perfect security. The name of the game is raising um, the amount of time and energy required to pull off these attacks because it's been too easy for too long. And so I think the takeaway message is every, we need to get rid of the jargon. We need more translators uh, in this space. We need to translate this for everyone, you know, down to your mother. Um, We need to make sure that CISOs are able to meet with boards directly to communicate what they need to to empower the organization so that they can defend themselves 
from the next, next Russian attack. We need to be asking very deep questions of our vendors. You know, anyone that we give access to our, our networks needs to be asked, what is your internal commitment to cybersecurity and how do you prove it? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a big picture, but, you know, one, one other last mode of optimism um, is, uh, like I said, I've never seen an appetite for more information on cybersecurity from, from all walks of life. Um, I've never seen tighter collaboration uh, in the space between the public private sector. I've never seen everyday people throw around terms like zero trust and S bombs, a software uh -huh. bill of materials, uh -huh. uh, MFA, you know, people are really eager uh, to learn about this. And if you can communicate it to them in a way that's not technical or not intimidating, we can make a lot of progress. So just take that home and, and do that wherever you can and with whomever you can. Yeah, thank you, thank you for those words. I mean, and 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 you're right. I mean, with it's it's not a time either to be too optimistic or too pessimistic. I think right right now is the time to, you know, just stand up, uh, go to our window, reach out, and shout as loudly as we can. I'm quoting Network, of course. If you know the movie, I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. And and view our our cybersecurity. Be, be mad as hell. You know, let's go do the things we know how to do. And, you know, what did, just as a, a final thought, the Verizon annual cybersecurity report, so much of this stuff is basic hygiene. You know, we can block 80% of the attacks with, with basic hygiene. We're not going to, you know, that's not 100%. That's not the advanced nation states. That's not Pegasus and NSO group, but it is so much for this. So, I mean, Nicole, thank you. Just, I'm totally grateful to you for your time. Our, our sponsors, Beckage, uh, California Lawyers Association, uh, IEEE, Orange County Computer Society, and, and of course, our, our good friends at, at, at Miller Kaplan. Thank you so much for this. Uh, with this, I'm going to say just thank you, thank you, thank you, Nicole, particularly. And with that, we're adjourned. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Stan. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week.